Carrie Jones. Well, Merry Christmas, everyone, and I hope you're all having a wonderful time. For this Christmas episode of my podcast, I've decided to do something a bit different. I've decided to put together a selection taken from the 25 podcasts since I started in July. I've been over the moon with the response what I've had. Not only am I really pleased with that, I thoroughly enjoy after every episode, I get messages, emails, and texts, giving some lovely feedback. Not only how much people have enjoyed it, but your own stories, why these particular stories meant so much, and that you're looking forward to more. Well, next year, I've got a whole new list already of new guests and ideas I've got for putting on the podcast channel. But if you've got any ideas or any people you want to hear me chatting to, or you want to hear me talk about, just send me a message. So in the meantime, if you're tying flies over Christmas and listening to this podcast, or you're just relaxing over a malt in front of a fire, I hope you enjoy listening to them as much as I have enjoyed doing them. So sit back and enjoy. Episode 2, Alan Reese. Just a few times with John Wilshaw, which used to be the editor of Trout and Salmon. Right, yeah. He was telling me this one story, and uh, he was fishing the Rydal. Right. And uh, something happened, and he, he got spooked. He thought, I'm not staying here, you know. I'm going to go. Yeah. So he got out of the river, and he ran across the field to his car. He couldn't <laughs> wait to run, <laughs> right? And as he ran across the field, he hit a cow sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> and he, you can imagine it. You're running across the field, you hit the cow. Ooh, jumped more. I don't know, the cow or him. Yeah. And this cow got up, a big warm thing you imagine you're falling on. He said it was terrifying. <laughs> and I can imagine. It, 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 but, you know, the, the whole night experience, the, I suppose the stories you can draw into it, it it's, it's a whole romance. It's a different thing altogether. Yeah. Just well, being there, listening to the owls as well and things yeah. creeping and around. And yeah, well, some of the stuff here you're talking about owls, you know, I used to fish a, a small stretch of river and there, there was a nice meadow next to it. And every evening I used to see two barn owls working that field, that meadow. And, you know, when, when they're in flight, they're absolutely silent. And they, they, they're only small birds, but they, they're really good. But, you know, you were talking about cows. I'd staked out this pool on the River Tyvee, okay? It, it was uh, above Clandisill there and... Uh, uh, and I knew they were fishing there because I'd been down and I'd looked, you know, I'd climbed a tree and seen these fish going around. And I, I sat there, oh, maybe two hours before dusk, and I thought, right, I, I'm going to be first on this pool. And as darkness started to come in, there was like sort of a, a, a high bank opposite, and I was sat there waiting. And I heard s- some branches starting to crackle, and I was like, someone's going to come down the bank there. And, and jump in the pool ahead of me. I, I'm not going to have that. And I waited and I waited, and these crackles and branches started getting a bit more and more. And more. All of a sudden, there was a, a massive crack, and I it, I found out later it was a pen a fence post had broken. There happened to be a cow scratching its back <laughs> against the fence. But when the fence pre- when the fence post broke, the cow came tumbling down through the trees. <laughs> right, yeah, down through the trees, off the bank, into the pool. And this cow was swimming in this pool going, moo, moo. <laughs> right? I wasn't happy, I tell you. Right? Uh, and I t- Episode six. I'll give you moo. Kerry you. Thomas. Get, um, the big pike there. Like they used to be in, in Clandeg, and I don't really know if they if they still in any size in Clandeg. It seems to have gone off the boil, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. It has. Of course, it produced those massive fish, didn't it? Um, I believe you took a photo, didn't you, of the, of the, um, the UK the, record? Yeah, yeah. I remember having a call one day from Anglin Times. They said, "Can you get over to Clandeg with as quick as you can? Because we think there's a British record pike." So it was about forty minutes from here, you know, maybe maybe longer, forty five. I said, yeah, I'll be there. So 
lucky though, there was before speed cameras then, so I would have broken everything going. So I got over there and uh, got to the damn wall, and there was one or two of the rangers there, and they said, where's this pike? And um, they said, oh, it's over in Greenpool, which is the, right at the far end, isn't it, opposite end of the lake. So I got on this speedboat, and Jesus, he just shot <laughs> over across, right? And as I got there into the shore, there was um, about five or six anglers there and one or two rangers just standing. And when I got up the boat, they said, we just put it back. I thought, oh, you're oh, kidding. No. It was unreal. It was it, a, a true as I'm, I'm st- sitting here now. We were standing there talking. After about two or three minutes, this fish just came swam back into the shallows as if to say, I want my picture taken. I can't believe it. So we got this guy then, the captor, Roy Lewis, with his friend, just to go in. We lifted the fish up, took about three frames, and put the fish back and swam off. And he was mad. You know, you couldn't have made the story up. And then the fish swam off, and that was £46. Pound. Yeah, incredible, and, isn't it? A fish of that size. You yeah. Know, you, you just you probably couldn't believe your eyes, could you, with the size of the thing? I remember how they weighed it because they didn't have scales that big. They weren't expecting, and the fishery didn't. And uh, there was a farm up from Greenpool. They got the scales which the farmer used to weigh his potatoes. How do you hell? Yeah. And no doubt they've obviously had a verified... Yeah, Yeah, they would have for that. Yeah, Yeah. for that, you know. Discovered uh, there was was a lake up near Tyvee Pools called Thlin Gunnon. I heard of it. You can fish as part of the Ryder Angling Club. And um, what we used to do is, um, we used to love it because um, you would always be guaranteed to catch a lot of fish there. It was, it was a good head of fish and, and yeah. the average size was like, um, you know, three quarters of a pound to a pound, you know. So we um, went up there, we fished the Tyvee pools, right, one one evening. And uh, we thought, oh, should we walk over to the gun on? Nice night for it, you know, middle of the summer. Yeah, let's do it, let's go there for the evening rise, isn't it? So it was about a two-mile walk there. So we got there, and it was great. We fished his head off, and we were completely engrossed with the fishing. And it was like about 9 o'clock now, yeah. middle of uh, middle of July, you know. Great, let's go back. And, and we looked around, and this thick mist, right, fog, was rolling in off the moor behind us, right. And this stuff now, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. <laughs> what the hell do we do now? So uh, we know the direction. We'll, we'll try and head back to the car. And uh, we sort of tried to cut ac- across the moor. And it, it's kind of, um, it's very boggy up there. And I sort know, of, it's um, great to open, isn't tussock it? Tussock grass and all this stuff. And, and we thought we were going in the right direction. So we were just walking and walking. It seemed like hours. And it was now about midnight. And, and it bloody, st- you know, couldn't see a thing. If we had been able to see the stars, you could have made out... Um, or the moonlight, uh, some of the mountains, you know. A romantic, them, them, it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> what do we do? Well, we sort of had to find a rock. It was a great big rock with like a little cave underneath this. So, so we had to wedge ourselves under that. And it was drizzle as well. Now, so we were soaking wet. And I believe there was a sheep or two in there as well to keep us company. So you were a cut with the sheep as well. Cut with the sheep, yeah, <laughs> and under a rock, yeah. So we spent the night up there. Did you spend the night? Spent the there? night. Yeah, we were stuck, and. um so it was about 7 a.m. now. It was a bit of light now, and it was still just as bad. Were well, you oh. expected back somewhere at a certain time? We probably were, but we never really used to tell our parents. We'd say, oh, yeah, we're going fishing, and we disappeared yeah. for a few days. Like, it was it was a bit different yeah. back then, wasn't it? But, um, yeah, so it was nearly as bad, and we were still lost. And uh, there was no sign of this stuff clearing. So I, I walked away from the cave. I was desperate for a pee, right? And uh, I came across a tarmacked road. And I was like, what the hell? You I was like, ah, ah, there's a road here. And we walked over, and, and it turns out this was the road by the side of Thlin Agnant. And we were about 200 yards from our car. No. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> Christ. So we, so we, you know, we'd nearly got there. Yeah. But uh, well, at least you got yeah. the sheep experience as well. The sheep experience as well, yeah. In Wales, like, two hundred uh, yards, yeah, from the car. Yeah, that's it, mate. But that's that's a Florida story. Episode eighteen, Colin Fallen. Like, I'm not going to talk about uh, famous people because uh, it, it, it's just it's that they're no different than than you or I. But uh, you'd get a lot of politicians, actors, musicians, the yeah, whole yeah. the whole uh, picture of them. 
uh, none of them really leave an impression on me anyway, to be honest with you. But uh, I tell you, I tell you one about, uh, no, I don't know. I suppose he's famous, uh, but I, I, I called him a feckin' Egypt anyway. And and uh, here's what happened was I was, uh, I was Gillian on Ban Hinch for the first week in July uh, for a fellow called Don Carroll. He was Carroll's cigarette. I was Don's Gilly and always the first seven days in July was, was, you know, year on, year off. That was always with Don. And sometimes he'd have a guest with him for the week. And this time he had a guest, a fellow from Belgium, an lad from Belgium. So anyway, well, three days into the fishing, we were fishing uh, beat one in Ban Hinch, and we were fishing on the far bank. And on the near bank, there's all rushes and reeds. And he hooked a, a fish about five or six pound. And the fish kept, you know, trying to run into the, the, the rushes on him, you know. And I kept saying to my sister, I said, don't, don't let him in there. I said, don't let, pull him out, but pull him out. And he wasn't stopping the fish at all. And, uh. Was it a trap? The fish went, no, it was a, a grilled salmon. Yeah. The, the fish went straight into the reeds anyway. I says, you fucking idiot. I says, I told you not to let him into the, <laughs> the reeds. And sure, the, the fly, the, we lost the fly as well, which kind of really annoyed me because I only had the one of it and it was working very well that week. So. I had to break, I had to snap the line anyway and got it back. So I finished up with them on the, the Friday and I knew they were going to to dinner in Roundstone, into O'Dowd's restaurant in, in Roundstone. You were actually in there with me one yeah, time. Yeah, I remember, yeah. Chowder. We had a liquid so lunch anyway, as well, I think. Liquid lunch. Do you see how I stopped? We had chowder and... Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so what happened was... Uh, I, I drove back to Galway after doing seven days work with them and I was emptying out my car and lo and behold, Yamano's fishing bag was in the, in the boot of my car, the Belgian fella. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, you want to see all the, the, the hardy reels he had and boxes of fully dressed salmon flies and this, that and the other. Like, this was this was 50 grand worth of stuff now in his, in his uh, bag, like a big bag. So I said to myself, I can't be responsible for uh, shipping this back to Belgium. Like I, I, I hardly even knew his name and stuff. So You'd forgot I it. I jumped back in the car. forgot it. Yeah, it was in my car. I jumped back in the car anyway, and I drove back out to uh, Roundstone, which is about an hour and a half from, from Galway. And I went into the restaurant and... I brought in the bag and there he was with Don and there was two other fellas, two kind of big heavies. And I, I said to myself, right, this makes sense now because I'd seen them two big fellas, you know, daily for the last week and stuff like that. You know what I mean? They were his bodyguards, right? right. So Don says, and says to me, uh, you'll stay for dinner and you can stay in my house. That's a brilliant uh, gesture what you're after doing there. And I said, well, thank you very much. I, I'll enjoy that. And he says, no, he says, Colin, I, I'll formally introduce you to the King of Belgium. He says, right, Albert, the King of Belgium. And I went, oh, hello. Uh, uh, how do I how do I refer to you, I says to him, you know? And he says, well, most people will call me uh, your majesty. He says, but I loved it when you called me a feckin' Egypt. <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm not used to being called a feckin' Egypt, he says. Right, so I says, I just called the King of Belgium a feckin' Egypt. So, <laughs> That was, that was good, yeah. Episode 12, Dennis Isbister. We flew into this, you know, in, in Alaska. We That's part of the deal. We fly into a remote area, get dropped off by the float plane. He says, he makes a loop over it in the air and says, you need to walk along here and drop off into this hole, and that's the river, and I'll pick you up in 10 hours. Okay. Wow. So it got bear spray on us, and, you know, I don't have a gun, but I should. And yeah, we got charged. This it was like a you know like a teenager bear, male bear, uh, charging us. And he got to about ten feet, twelve feet, charging, coming at us. And I sprayed the bear spray. And what <laughs> happened was uh, I got Drew in the face and myself in the face. And, you know, I the, missed bear the bear stop. <laughs> yeah, I missed the bear. <laughs> and, uh, it's a, it's a pretty funny story hindsight, but yeah, it's a fog. If you've ever sprayed bear spray, which most people haven't, oh. uh, it's a fog. And I mean, I would, if I was going to make bear spray, it'd be like wasp spray. It would spray 20 or 30 feet out there in a stream, you know, like a <laughs> rocket. This shit, 
shit was a fog. I was like, what is this crap? You know, just this big fog came back in our faces and we were oh, screaming. God. And, oh, it was, was it a black bear, painful. was it? No, it was a grizzly, yeah. Like, a all grizzly? grizzly bears. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it was scary at the time. Funny story, hindsight, you know, we were full of bear spray and coughing and dying and we hit the bear with a couple rocks and we got a couple, you know, ended up getting like 20 yards of separation. Episode 14, my 19 pound ferox. Only a fish for about, about two hours, I thought, oh, it's just time for a break now. Because it is vitally important to have a break. It's good for the soul and the mind. When you're out in that lake doing it all the time, it, it can get you. So I headed into Cleanalon, which is a lovely island. with a, It's almost like a horseshoe shape, so you can go in. It's nice and secluded. So I lit the fire and sat down at the edge of the water. And I'm watching in the calmness of the inside of this horseshoe in the island. And I can see this little trout. And he must have been, you know, I don't know, eight ounces, something like that. Only a small trout. But he was feeding really well on Mayfly. And I thought to myself, one day he's going to be a big fella. He carries on like that. So I was sitting by the comfort of a, a nice fire, Watching this little trout. And everything in life was great, you know. You thought, this is what it's all about. I finished my sandwiches and my cuppa. It's packing up. I told the little trout, help me find the big lad in the lake. So I jumped in the boat and motored off and go round towards Inchigil again. By now, there was big, not so much the rollers, it was gustiness, you know. And I thought, oh, is this going to stop? Four mile out in the lake, and the adrenaline is good, mate, but all of a sudden it starts getting worse. I'm not sure what the strength of the wind was. It was something like a storm force 10, and I mean, it was big wind. And at this point, then the rods were slapping the waves, and I just lost it. I screamed at the sky, telling it to stop blowing. And the weird thing was, it started to stop coincidence or what or they must have gods must have thought I'll give this guy a break now he's been here for some time and the wind dropped only a little but it was a lovely soft wind then you hear it very often in Ireland there's a soft wind there's no scurrying the gusts on the water it's just nice slow people who experienced it you'll know what I mean there's a lovely roll on the water and it's so comfortable and the sky went dark, really dark. And that deep grey colour came onto the water. It's almost like a mercuriness to it. There's times I've been there, and when you know that happens, you are just got to switch on, put everything into it. Because there are times, it's almost like a sixth sense, when the light and the wind comes together, a certain time, you know things are going to happen. And that feeling, the electricity is in the air. I'm just starting to row in and row in with the wind. Next thing, it happens. The left rod just arced round and screamed. And then the first time I see the fish, he came towards the boat, did the usual trick, dived underneath. This time he stayed in front of the boat. The wind just drops, a gentle wave. At this point, he was about literally 20 foot away. And this is the first time I've seen him. He leapt out and back in like a dolphin, in slow motion, as if to take a look at who I was. And he went down deep and deep and deep and deep. The line was going zit, 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 down, down, down. And then, as if to say, I'm going to have one more run at this was round then to the back of the boat screamed off again for the third time again must have been about 60 yards a, a, a good way you know and then for the first time just come up to the surface I put my net in and then as soon as I had the fish in the net the sky just emptied with hailstones it was unreal never experienced it up to then and I've never experienced it since 
He was lashing down with like marble sized hail. So I quickly lifted the fish over the gunnels into the boat. And it was that point I thought, geez, that's some fish. I looked at the bottom of the boat and it was white and it looked like snow. It was just covered in ice. And coming out of the ice then was this pristine looking, beautiful ferox. And I couldn't have been happier. I just looked up to the sky and the hail was hurting me at this stage. And I just roared from the bottom of my feet the release of all the weeks and the years previous looking for a specimen and having lost them along the way. And unless you experienced it, something you want to achieve and you've actually done it, you've got to pinch yourself. And after I roared, the hail stopped. First thing I did then, slip him in the sling. It was time to use my brand new Rapala scales. Lifted the fish up. The scales went 19 and a half pounds. And to this day, it's the second biggest ferox I've had. I've had many teens since. And of course, the record, which actually is another story when keeping for another day. Episode 7, David Miller. And I see a snorkel coming up into the pool. <laughs> I do, I do, for obvious reasons, avoid going at night. De- definitely, I, I, I have upset over the years. I'm literally just one or two fishermen when they've turned up to fish a pool and they've seen me sort of uh, coming out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in one in one pool on on the coffee. What I what I do to relax um, after a dive sometimes, like you're chasing, um, you know, shadows really, the fish are here and then they're gone and it's hard work, you're swimming upriver. So we've have had a session photographing and also just because it's what I, what I love to do, late in the season one year on the coffee, it was a deep pool, about 10 feet deep and I had a good dive, seen some fish. So I lay on my bike on the bottom of the pool you can just lie as, as a with your scuba gear on, watch the surface and watch the leaves coming down. Wow! And it, it is, it is like wow, this is amazing. So, but some guy I couldn't see him had arrived to fish the pool, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he sees me and he thinks I'm stuck. And he said, because uh, I don't know how many minutes I was, I was lying there, not not moving, and the coffee, especially when I dive, I choose it when it's really clear, and so he could see virtually every every detail on me. Lie, lying on the bike non <laughs> and when when I you know finally decided he said I was just about to uh, phone the emergency services <laughs> so thankfully he was. episode 24 Stephen Gale I remember one of our days we went to Blackdown and we tackled up as we did went to the boat put our gear in the boat and with electric engines then and it, it took in fact you had your own electric engine because it was a windy day, I'm not sure if we had two engines, one as a spare, just because, you know, the battery would go. No, it wasn't two engines, two, two batteries, batteries, rather. Yeah. So it took ages for us to get up to the top end in a big wind. And all of a sudden you said, I've left my fly box back at the car. Ah, oh, and I thought, well, it's going to take ages to go back now, yeah. and the batteries were not really good as it was. So we fished all day, didn't we? We did. <clears throat> and uh, you used some of my flies then. And then I think we had a, a good day. Then when we got back to the car then, because you left it on top of the car. On top of the car. And we thought, it's not going to be there, no. And as we got to the to- got to the car, there, in the, I could see walking towards it, the flight box was open still. So but the good thing was, when we got there, you said, I don't believe it. There's more flies in it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the people in England are a lot nicer than anglers, and they, they, they could see what rubbish had in my box. Yeah. So they thought they'd have you on. And do you remember? Because they had their own boat, and there was a slipway, and they had a high S <laughs> van. I think one of the boys then he had the high S van with a with a boat trailer, and he reversed into the slipway, stepped out. Column then was rowing the boat to put onto on the, the trailer. trailer to take the boat out. And when the boat got on the trailer, it was obviously more weight, and there wasn't enough tension on the handbrake. And the whole boat, the trailer, and half the van just sunk Thank into the... God. And then Rolling everyone back. was flapping around. The van, the van, the, the, van, the fucking van. van. <laughs> and then you, everyone just watching. And then I, I darted over to look for the handbrake. And I couldn't find it. 
And then I seen you just dive in through the window of the passenger. <laughs> the handbrake was on the dash. Yeah. Remember, you, you, you had to pull the handbrake from yep. the dash. And we stopped it from going totally submerged. Totally submerged. It was still all right. It worked after. I know. That's that Toyota. Was the highest for you, man. I don't see. Bulletproof. And I had my <laughs> XR4i then. And oh, I, God, told, no, no. I told the van out then. Luckily, I had a, a tow bar in it as well. Like. Biggest fright they ever had with that XR4. <laughs> you had, oh, and it wasn't the one where, where you were racing back from uh, Blackdown or Chew or wherever we'd been. It was when your father was driving it from North Wales. <laughs> 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 Do you remember? And we come under the bridge. <laughs> And we, I don't know, we both woke up because we were both sleeping in your father's drive. And we went, stop! Because he was heading straight for the roundabout. He must have been doing about 90 miles an hour. Was it? I don't remember that. You must remember it, Kerry. Uh, I think with, with shocks like that, you put it... Put it in the back of your mind. Mind. <laughs> Episode 20, Andy Taylor. How did you come about to get the top rod? What method did you use on that day? The international... We, we practiced hard as, as, as a team, and, and I think probably with most forms of fishing, my view on, on, on a trout taking the flies, it takes it through because it thinks it's a, a food, so we're matching the hatch. It takes it through aggression, or it takes it through, you know, curiosity. And I think uh, over that sort of period of practice, we realised that um, aggression was going to fall one of the sort of key tactics for us. So, you know, I've got a couple of zonka patterns which work really, really well, and um, they worked on practice. So. For us practicing, once we got a couple of methods working, we came off it and stopped doing it. And every now and then, one of us would try it just to get the confidence. So fishing a, a, a Zonkron so on a um, intermediate line was one of the tactics. Um, we used the slime lines, clear intermediate lines, um, using the indicator. So sort of looking at sort of curiosity. One of the guys had got a, a pack called a chamois, um, and we got some small leg flies. They work really well. And again, we found on the first day of practice that we were working, so we came off them. Occasionally, someone would go in and try it just to make sure things were working. And then we, we, we also realised that we were fish to be caught on the surface that would come for small flies. And we could see that a lot of teams were fishing CDC patterns. And we tried that, and we got interest, but we wouldn't commit. So we found that small shipping buses worked quite effectively the fish were more confident just to sort of break the surface rather than actually rise and take the fly yeah so we we got three tactics which we we'd all got confidence in uh, a couple of shipments a chamois or an egg fly under the bung and um, pulling zonkers back through quite quickly and for me I, on that match day for the team we were confident in our tactics we 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 worked and played hard together and we'd had a really enjoyable week and when it came to match day I'd got a peg which I had fished on practice, I'd caught off, and I got off to a good start. Um, I got uh, a couple of fish off there quite quickly, and that gave me the confidence to get going. And on the next peg, I knew it'd been difficult, um, not, not many fish had come out of it, and again, I caught off that. And I knew that my third peg, when I got there, the controller said that no one had caught off it, and I caught off that. And by that time, you know, I'd got the confidence, and I knew that, you know, if I kept going, that you know, as an individual, I'd catch you know, I, I would catch fish. I've got confidence in all the methods. And at, uh, at the halfway stage, we came back in, and um, obviously people were topping the scores up, and we knew that we were we were out in front. And uh, you know, in the afternoon, the England team we, we kept catching. And I, that confidence grew and grew and grew. And eventually, I, I fished my last peg, and the controller said to me. There's only been one fish caught off this peg all day, and that was this morning. No one's had a fish off it this afternoon, and I knew that I would catch off it. And it was the confidence, you know, the yeah. confidence in, in the flies, the confidence in the techniques and the tactics, you know. And I, I caught, I think, off my last peg two fish, and I lost another one. And the controller said, you know, no one else caught off there. And, you know, by that time, those fish had seen a lot of flies, had had a lot of pressure, and, you know, I just changed my tactics concentrated on the margins and, and pick fish up, you know, fishing right under your feet as opposed to, you know, launching out 20, 30 yards and fishing water, which is doing a lot of lines, a lot of pressure on it. So fishing the less pressured waters in the afternoon, you know, worked for me. And yeah. uh, in the end, we were, as a team, we were successful. You know, I was successful as an individual. And, you know, it was just a great, great experience. A great four days away with, you know, five or six uh, guys from the team who were, 
you know, great company. It was, it was probably one of the best experiences of, you know, I've, I've, I've ever had. Episode 21, Gullum Hughes. Until I won it on the River Tweed in Scotland. Did you? Won the international championship. And, uh, so yes, you, the you, Mock Morgan Trophy and the Mike Childs Trophy. During the whole day, I caught, I think it was 17 brown trout on a dry fly. Well, a fly that I created during the week, which I've actually got around, the, is fished around the world now. Uh, the Cull de Cannon, I called it. Yeah. There were fish in practice. There were fish moving in and amongst some ranunculus weed there. And I could get very close to them. Could I catch them? I couldn't do anything with them. And all of a sudden, you'd see a fish coming up, bloop, on the top. And I couldn't understand why. And flies floating down, and they were ignoring them. The blue-winged olive. And I realized in the end that they wanted the fly just hitting the surface film. So when I went back to the hotel that night, I had a word with the lads, and I said, I'm bloody sure, I says, that they want this fly just in the surface film. So I got a curved shank hook, and I actually used primrose tying thread with a cobbler's wax, the same as the Greenwood's Glory was dressed. Yeah. And I actually used that for the body, deer hair on the back, to hold the, the uh, caldicanid feathers up, so that the fly actual hook was in under the water, under the film, or just in the film, and the rest I could see. Anyway, the next day I went out and tried this and caught three fish in three casts, took the fly off, of course, and said no more. And uh, I tied them all that night. Everybody had one. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Even though you, you know you know but it's I a did. But I to did. take it off. Yeah, yeah but I did. I didn't want people to see that I was catching fish with it, you know. And yeah. anyway, it, it worked for me. Uh, Wales won the gold medal in Scotland on that year, and I won the individual. Fantastic. And you know something? It'll never, I'll, it'll never leave me. <clears throat> I think it was Franz Grimley, um, the Scottish lad, that approached me. He said, do you know something? He says, this is history today. What do you mean? He said, you're the first one, he said, ever in the history of these competitions to have won both the lakes and the Rivers International Championship. Yeah. In episode 25, Ethel Griffiths. Was, uh, sort of, I went fishing one evening in what was then um, water, what I would call betwixt and between, a bit high for night and a bit low for day. You know, there's a there's an in-between water right. level. And um, I went fishing, day fishing, and uh, it was back end of July, and uh, went day fishing, and uh, caught possibly 15 or 20 suing. Nothing bigger than two pounds, but you know what I mean. In the day. In the day, yeah. And... On my way down the river, because I walked quite a long way, on my way down the river, I'd seen a salmon show in this particular place called Murphy's, and I thought, I'll go back up and I'll try for that guy, right, on my way back. So I come back back up the river, and because salmon will often take just, you know, just before the half light, you know? Yeah, I, yeah. And um, I knew where he was. So I walked back up and there was a chap sitting on the pool and he was a man called Lord Golding. He'd been uh, an MP and uh, in the House of Lords, very keen fisherman. So I, ha I said to John, uh, I said, I tell you, t there's a salmon in here. I said, why don't you have a go for it? Oh, he said, I'm set up for night fishing. So I had a chat with him and I walked back up and I thought I'll fish the pool above. And I went in there and the same sort of scenario, I, I lost a couple of fish, boom, boom, in, in the fast water in the tail. And I thought I'm going to sort one of these out. So I put a big tandem on and I went in 
and uh, much higher up, and I hooked this fish, and it was just, I know it was, it back end of July, it was about 10.30, and uh, this fish, actually one of only two in my life, sea trout, took me out of the pool, and he went down into the run below, and must have gone round John Golding's legs, because he was in the river fishing. <laughs> because I could see him looking down. I was shouting, and he couldn't hear me. And I thought, I'm going to have to cross. And, and crossing there was over your waders. Yeah. You know, it was up to, up to chest waist. waders. Oh, yeah, yeah. Chest waders. No, no, no. Over the chest waders, right? And wow. I went across. I got a bit wet. Not in the bad. dark. That's yeah, scary. Yeah. And then <laughs> shouted again because obviously I was closer to him, and he said, oh, there's something going on. Anyway, we, we got the fish, and as it happened, he'd got, um, it was a hen fish, and, and it was before the days of um, digital cameras and all that, you know what I mean? It was, we're going back now, uh, 91 or 92. Um, he had a, 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 a sort of a keep net thing, which used to fish a lot for barbel, this gentleman. Oh, yeah. And this thing looked like a boat. You know, it was like a way net. looked like a, the shape of a boat. Yeah, yeah. A sling. Yeah, it was a sling. So he, we put this fish into this sling, and it weighed 19 pound 10. And then we put her back, and she was fine. You know what I mean? She went back. Yeah. And it was very wasn't the end of the story actually because I then went home and to get home I had to go under a couple of electric fences they were that horrible height which means you can't get over them <laughs> <laughs> and know. and they're a bit low to get under them you know yeah. you know that so I got home and in those days I used to put my fly boxes out to dry always there was a boiler you know in the in the utility room and I'd got home without one of my fly boxes. So the following evening, I went back up the Dubby, I went to the keeper's house, which is up on the main road, between here and Mahantlet. I went to the keeper's house, and he was the keeper, I said, you haven't by any chance got a, f a fly box? And he said, yeah, I've got your fly box. He said, John Golding picked it up. It was under an electric fence. I knew where it was gone, you know, I hadn't closed, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, um, Anyway, he said, what time did you get that fish last night? I said, I don't know, 10, 15, 10, 30. You know what I mean? That yeah, yeah. type of time. And he said, um, last night at the same time, he said, um, a man called Warbridge, who was fishing a mile below me, right? A mile or so below me um, in the Sigui. Had a fish of nineteen pound one, he said. And those were two of the biggest fish caught on this river for years. And and they were caught at the same time. It's really strange. Huh? Episode four, Vaughn Thomas. The sea's a big place, isn't it? The sea's a big place, and you've got the tides. You've got an infinite amount of variations. Uh, whereas, so okay, so you start with the river. You've got. If it's in spate, well, you can still fish it. If it's on, on its knees in, de in lows of summer, you can still fish it. If you go to a lake, if as long as the wind isn't gale force, you can fish it. Whereas at the sea, you've got the tides. So every six, six and a quarter hours, the tide goes from high tide to low tide. And then the next six and a quarter hours, roughly, it'll, it'll go back from low tide to high tide. Yeah. And then those tides themselves vary with the moon phase. So you get uh, neap and spring tides, neaps uh, when it's at half moon, um, and the tide doesn't move that, that much. And generally the fish aren't as active, whereas on the spring tides, where you, you know, especially on Gower, you get a variation of up to 14 metres. So you get a lot of ground which is exposed for fish to come and forage, especially on the incoming tide. So you've got to understand tides... So your two types of swells are your wind swells, which are localised wind swells, and 
like today where we've had a, a gentle breeze of about 20 miles an hour, it will produce a small, short period wave, uh, which is good for fishing, um, especially if it's on shore. Um, it's, uh, it can be very good for bass. Um, but you've also got long-range swells. Now, I understand all this from surfing. And yeah, and as watching, I see, it's going to be a big help with the yeah, surfing. Watching weather charts, uh, again, years ago, there were no... Um, there was no surf reports. The only weather report you had was the farming forecast on a Sunday, and you'd watch that for low pressures out out in in, in the Atlantic. Um, and if there was one there, you you wait three days, and it take about three days for the swell to actually arrive on our coastline. Um, and that can catch a lot of people out with fishing on the coast because it can be a beautiful day, offshore breeze, but there'll be a huge ground swell. And these swells are very powerful, um, and you need to know all of these factors. Episode 15, Mark Roberts, to lamp points. I never cast a double-handed fly rod. I never needed to because I, I just rarely fished for salmon and rarely fished rivers. But I remember on that day, you showed me the basics, and dude, in showing me, you actually caught a salmon. You remember yeah. that? I do. Yeah. Well, I, I I try not to when I'm teaching people. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing. Uh, yeah. But um, I, I mean, the thing, the anomaly about salmon fishing is, is with the two-handed rod, you've got three personalities involved in it. You've got your left hand, which is Mister Left, your right hand, which is Mister Right, and you're in the middle trying to decide which one yeah. does what. And really, it's just. There's so many styles to salmon casting. Uh, you didn't start off fly fishing, did you? No, no. I Well, I'm originally from Cheshire. Um, and although we, you, later on, in as I got older, my father took me to the River Dane, which was the first flowing bit of water I ever fished at. But I started off as a three-, four-year-old with... Um, my Woolworths six foot fiberglass rod, which, that if I remember rightly, the 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 rod blank itself was almost bright yellow, and the handle was like a fluorescent red plastic. Wow! But but this this was my rod, and yeah. my reel, and nobody was allowed to go near it. And we went fishing in the in an old clay pit with my brother, and uh, I caught my first fish, which, like most people, would probably be a three-inch perch. Right. Couldn't really use the reel, so float went under, turned around, put the rod over my shoulder, and ran up the bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You've come on a bit since then. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm, some might not agree with you there. They think uh, uh, I still haven't got the subtlety that's needed, but no, yeah, it's... It just lit a fire in me, in my, in my soul, and I've always fished. Episode 9, Jason Williams. We had a food up to sort of 10 pound yeah. plus, maybe. Yeah. Uh, on the um, the deer hair imitated yeah. biscuit. Yeah, biscuit, yeah. We, the weird thing was, wasn't it? like you're left-handed, I'm right-handed, and we only had a short, small little bit of bank to fish. So then you told me, well, we swap round. Yeah, I swap round go, with it. Yeah, pour yeah. your water. <laughs> <laughs> I was daft. I thought they were making you conven- convenient for you, but you spotted something, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I spotted, um, I could see all the reeds moving. And I thought there's something in there, or there's a couple in there. And I put uh, the kicking beetle on, didn't I? That's a beige colour, and it's like, to me, it's a beige colour, but it still looks like, to me, like, a bit of like a dog biscuit because it's the colour of it, you know. It was an overhanging tree, wasn't it? Yeah, it was an overhanging big oak tree there, and a lot of reeds growing. And I just put out about three or four foot in front of the reeds, and instantly, big mouth came up and engulfed it straight away. Wow, you know, and uh, that's when you looked around and all that was breaking loose. Are, are these uh, or is that particular pattern when you tied yourself? Yeah, then? yeah. Is this something you've made up? Well, yeah, it is patterns similar to it, but the colour. Right. Usually the patterns like that are dark and black, or but I've made it into a very like a beigey. Yeah, and it's got legs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's got four little rubber legs. Yeah, is it ether form or something? Is it? Yeah, it yeah. It's ether form on the top. Yeah, and there's a bit of red on the top, so you can sightsee it and only out distance for it. Like, because I just looked over then and I could see 
you were into a fish, and well, I was only about twenty yards away, maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit more. But your line was already way out, sort of twenty five yards. Oh, I gone, thought. yeah, instantly, yeah, yeah. And I thought you'd hooked it out there, but you said no, no in the sides. Yeah, or? yeah. Before I could even see yours went on, it, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they 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 can they can strip you when before you know it, you don't really run the back end. You can you're not far from being spooled. Yeah, sometimes you know, and because you've got a couple of area what they call like the big fountains there you've got to watch it don't go around them one of the things i really enjoy doing on my podcasts is the last cast which i ask everyone at the end of our chat so here's a small selection from my guests episode 19 alice davis one more question i ask everyone to finish off is where would you want to be to make your last cast I, I thought long and hard about this and I think I'd want to go back where it all started, which is on the little stream either side of my village. I would love to go back and cast a line into those streams. I know one of the streams has still got brown trout in it, those streams. That's and who lovely. knows, one day I might. Yeah, that's a lovely thought. I do a lot of walking and on this one particular bridge I cross on one of these streams, the wildlife, the damselflies and everything, and I was watching the trout coming up for the flies in the sunlight streaming through the trees down on this particular pool. Beautiful. You can't beat that. Episode 11, Chris Wadley. So, one thing I... So you're going to ask the question now. Yeah, you oh, can't. Hang on. I'm still not already. Give me two seconds. Give me two seconds. Now. See, this is the problem. You really talk about stuff, and then I completely forget what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, Actually, say. things like this I might leave in. Um, so, oh, back have to you, you. yeah, have you thought of uh, the no? But I'll, I'll give you an answer anyway. Ask me the question. One thing I ask everyone uh, to finish off: Where would you want to be to make your last cast? It would probably be on the River Tawi. Um, oh, scratch that. We'll do that again. Um, <laughs> it's not. It's not. I don't even know what it is, Kerry. Um, where would I want to be? Is it where I want to be? Okay, where I want to be. Where I'd like to. We got your last hour of fishing. You know, it's ever like your last mate. It's like okay, a okay, condemned okay. man's meal sort of thing. Okay, you know? go for it. Okay, so my last hour of fishing. Where would I like to fish? There's a reason why I fish canned food so much, and there's a reason why I keep on going back, and that hasn't changed, and it won't change. And I think that is where I want to spend my last hour because when you understand the fishery so well, you can really zone in and reap the rewards or the benefits out of it. It's hard to do that and hard to say no to that. And I think that's where my enjoyment is. That's where I like being and that is where I probably do my last cast. I hope it won't be your last cast this weekend, but it'd be nice to meet up in Garth Road. Yeah, definitely. And I will uh, look forward to having a little competition with you then. Oh, bring it on. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> I look forward to it. Cheers, Reese. Thanks very much, Kerry. Episode 16, Dennis Cronin. Well, I'd say I'd like to make my last cast on my own river salon below on this summer's evening on the Denzig Bank, we call it, as Denzig is in Germany, the Denzig Bank. Has a beautiful gravelly area where lots of fish rise and it's perfect for dry fly, and that's where I'd like to finish my days. Wow. They can be hauling me up out of there if I hop down there to be great. That's what I'd like to go. My own river, as you're looking wet, you can see the sun and the light, and it's beautiful. So that's where I'd like to be on my last day. Episode 3 Tony Davis. Do you know, Kerry, that, that is a good question. I think it would be on Big Island, underneath Plinlimon, which is one of the few wild, naturally wild lakes, a bit like Tyvee Pools. Yeah. Tyvee Pools. That's where I'd like to be. I'd like to be there in May, because they still have the claret done, because the water's not polluted, it's all heather and moor, so there's no farming up there, only sheep on the fields, uh, sorry, on the land. Uh, Absolute paradise for wild Claret brownies. Dunn. Yeah. Um, my memory is not working so well, but I fished it years ago with Emma Lewis, one of the Welsh water bailiffs, great fisherman, Emma. Uh, and I'd been reading, I think it's Harris's book on the fly fisherman's entomology. It was written in the 50s. 
it was the forerunner of he, he took the first color photographs plates right. of insects and he related the fly life to patterns to use and i was reading this book it was my dad's and the nymph is with claret with a gold rib and i forget the hackle i think i'm right it would have a, a very sparse bronze mallard fibers and a tail the same and emir and i'll finish on this one was sitting in the boat and they suddenly started rising now we'll have some fish too and he's a good fisherman and he was getting fish i was getting two to every one of his and he didn't like it i was only about 18 at the time as a what are you using and i showed him good god what's that he said i've never seen one like that now the nearest wet fly equivalent would be do you know the fly the cock and lass it's the, the heather fly and it's got a red hackle throat hackle black body with a silver rib and a mallard wing feather made that fly on big island as it used to be on a drifting boat on a drifting boat yeah. i would go I back there yeah. it's where i started it's full circle it's yeah. funny isn't it yeah that's uh, lovely it's how it works episode 23 jamie miller it would have to be gone through it. I mean, I, I started uh, fly fishing on their opening day back in 1984. I can remember it. Coming back off the lake with blisters on my hand. Uh, but uh, I've not looked back. You know, it's just nearly 36 years of fly fishing. Wouldn't want to end it on anywhere else other than gone through it. Yeah. And get Lewis to wheel you down to the uh, lake. Yeah, he'll have to wheel me down for one last cast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thoroughly enjoyed the chat. And hopefully, I'll actually come and join you on the, uh, the competition, the Christmas competition. Yes. Because I've only got turkey slices at the moment. I never know. There might be a hamper in it for you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much, Jamie. You're welcome. Cheers. Episode 18, Colin Fallen. One question I ask everyone. Where would you want to be yeah. to make your last cast? You know, I, I, was, I was thinking about that and... Uh, there's 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 two places uh, I couldn't have one uh, I, I could only have them both right. uh, I'd be greedy uh, the first one is definitely 100% at the Derry Clare Butts on a summer's night uh, the last hour of sunlight with kind of medium to low water not high water and no wind really really calm beautiful sky and come and dark because all the salmon come into the in between the piers to uh, jump up over the fish counter and, and head up into the river but they don't really go, go over that counter during the day they don't like the they like it at dusk so that's the kind of time where you know you might get 40 minutes where you could meet you know three or four salmon in 40 minutes you know and you probably get one or two you know you get two anyway you know, a small little nine foot rod, seven weight, eight or ten pound break and strain, floating line, and, you know, a size 10 or a size 12, uh, tied on a trout, you know, like a Camazon B175, just an ordinary, like, black and silver, that's all they want, you know. That is just heaven, and for me. And the other part is to be stuck out in the, the middle of Loch Horeb, uh, during the olives, a nice wet day, plenty of rain and be in some big bay like Valley Curran or Anna Down or somewhere like that and fishing the dries, you know, fishing your, your size fourteen and sixteen green wells and F flies and stuff in a in a in a downpour of rain. That that's that's heaven. Sounds so ideal. They're, they're the two Yeah. Yeah. Well I thoroughly yeah. enjoyed our chat and hopefully if restrictions yeah. allow um, we'll have a day or two next year out and perhaps make some more stories. Absolutely. Sure, look, I'll see you. You'll be, you'll be back over here as soon as this uh, I will thing be. dies down a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I will be um, looking forward we'll to it. A, we'll, we'll have a day on the car up anyway. Absolutely. All right, thanks again. Very welcome, Kerry. Cheers, Colin. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Okay, all the best. Yachida. <laughs> Episode 19, Colin Jardine. Place I really would love to go back to. I'd like to be sandwiched between the Madison Valley and, and um, Box Canyon because then I could 
spend an afternoon or a morning on the Madison and then finish it off on Henry's Fort. Right. And that's really where I'd love to be because of no place I've ever fished has anything like Henry's Fort when it's in, in a, her majestic best being able to fill the senses like that river. I mean, it, it is just the most beautiful place to be. A sort of whispering dry grass of late autumn. You've got sandhill cranes going back south down to Mexico to overwinter. You've got the first first vestiges of snow across the Tetons in the background. And you know what? And you've got trout sipping tiny western blue olives or sulfurs. Oh, man. It's like sometimes, Kerry, it's like fishing for ghosts. Episode 21, William Hughes. Oh, those things, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But it's fantastic fishing in Ireland. Great fishing. And yeah. Corrib especially. Like, yeah. I know how you love it and yeah. why. I can yeah. tell. Because, you know, you, yeah, it's a hard it, place to leave. Oh, it is. Yeah. A tremendous place, yeah. Well, I've enjoyed our chat. And uh, I want to see you tie some flies now and then maybe have a rummage room to have a look at your tackle as well. There's one question I ask everyone. Yes. You know what's coming up. Where would you want to be to make your last cast? Can I have two choices? <laughs> Go on then. In a bottle of Blackberry whiskey or in a bottle of Blackberry gin? I want to drink that fish. <laughs> Well, that's something I wasn't expecting. Well, there you go. I've done it all, and uh, I'm proud of what I've achieved. Don't get me wrong, I am proud of what I've achieved. But I also like the fact that I've been able to pass all this information on so that it makes it easier for people that are coming into the sport, you know, to achieve. That's what it's about. Well, let's hope we'll have uh, a couple of days next year. Restrictions allow. Perhaps uh, I'll come up and join you and have a Absolutely. day on the river. That'd be nice. Or yes, a couple of hours nice. on a boat somewhere. Yeah, it'd be nice. Yeah. yeah. And show me how to catch these big ferox trout. I'm on the case. Yeah. I'll drink a bottle of whiskey and you can fish for the ferox. <laughs> Just get ready with the net. Thanks again for your support. And a dolly clown and blow the net with that. Tight lines. If this is your first time tuning in, Make sure you catch all future episodes by clicking subscribe via the links on my website, castingwithkerryjones.com, or via iTunes or your favourite podcatcher. If you like what you've heard on this episode, feel free to drop me a line via my website. Tell me what you've enjoyed, ask a question, or better yet, tell me what you want to hear more of in the future. And if you're looking for additional tips, tackle reviews, or venue information, or just want to see what's been hitting the back of my net lately, search up Casting with Kerry Jones on Facebook or follow me on Instagram. And if you still want more, I'm regularly uploading video content onto the Casting with Kerry Jones YouTube channel, so just check that out and subscribe over there too. Wherever you follow, subscribe, comment or message, I look forward to catching up soon for a good fishing chat. Well, I think that's all for now, so until next time, tight lines and don't strike too soon. <laughs> <laughs>